Okay, let's make a start. Um, so last time we covered quite a lot of theory, so I want to start just by giving a summary or a reminder of what we did last time. So we started with the postulates of special relativity. Postulates. Of which there were two. The first says that constant speed of light in a vacuum for inertial observers. The second one says that we should have this principle of relativity. Which says you can't tell the difference between being stationary or moving with a constant velocity. Okay. Um, so, these, um, these principles have some consequences for the measurements of space and time. Okay? So, in particular, last time we focused on the particular situation where you have two observers, who I called S and S prime. Okay? And these observers are making measurements of space and time. Okay? So, in order to do that, they need something like a ruler to measure space and something like a clock to measure time. So you give both of these observers a ruler and a clock. Okay. And one of the observers is moving relative to the other at a certain speed, certain velocity u. Okay. Now the most simple assumption you can make is that there's no difference between this observer's measurements in space and time and this observer's measurements in space and time. In other words, their rulers behave in exactly the same way, and their clocks behave in exactly the same way. Right? Now, if you make that assumption, that gives you the Galilean transformation, right? which was this one. So x prime is x minus ut, t prime is t. Okay? That basically says there's no difference between the behavior of the rulers and the clocks. Okay? However, we showed that these postulates here contradict this Galilean transformation. Okay. So in other words, if the postulates are true, the Galilean transformation cannot be true. And that means that our assumptions that the clocks behave the same and the rulers behave the same must be wrong. Okay. What we did last time was to show that you can make um, a theory of measurements of space and time between these two observers, which are consistent with these postulates, if you assume three effects, okay, so we talked about three effects last time. The first one was length contraction. Okay, this means that relative to, from the perspective of this observer here, the ruler of the observer who is moving is shortened. Okay, so this ruler appears to be contracted in the direction of motion. The second one is time dilation. This says that from the perspective of this observer, this observer's clock appears to go slowly, it records less time. Okay? That's time dilation. And the final one is relative simultaneity. This says that if this observer has two clocks and this observer thinks the clocks are synchronized, that means they tick at the same time, then this observer thinks the clocks are not synchronized. He thinks they tick at different times. And in particular, the clock in front is behind in time. So the clock in front shows less time, according to this observer. Okay, and we showed last time that if you combine these three effects in some specific quantities, then you can come up with a theory of the measurements of space and time which are consistent with these postulates, okay? which satisfy that the speed of light is a constant and also the principle of relativity that this observer's measurements and this observer's measurements are symmetrical. Okay. And using these, we came up with a new transformation of space and time which was known as the Lorentz transformation. OK? 
okay, which we worked out last time, very end of last time, says x prime is gamma times x minus ut, t prime is gamma times t minus u over c squared x. Okay. Where this factor gamma is 1 over the square root, 1 minus u squared over c squared. Right, so that's where we, that's all of what we did last time, basically. Um, what I'm going to do today then is, is I want to say a bit more to motivate um, the acceptance of this Lorentz transformation. If you remember before all this, what, we were, what was the starting point, the motivation for these postulates, was some experiments, so that, namely the michelson morley experiment and the observations of aberration, which could not be easily explained using this idea of the ether. Okay? So instead of the ether, you could explain the observations using these postulates, okay? from which all of this follows. But that may s sound a bit weak. Okay? We just had a couple of experiments which didn't really work, you know, which we couldn't quite explain. But based upon that, we have made a, a huge theoretical change to physics. Okay? In particular, we've abandoned the idea of absolute measurements of space and time. According to the Galilean transformation, if one observer thinks something takes one second, then all observers think it takes one second. Right? They agree upon measurements of time. If one observer thinks the length of something is one meter, then all observers think the length of something is one meter. Right? But in the Lorentz transformation, this is not the case. All observers have different measurements of time and different measurements of length according to their relative velocities. Okay. So this is a huge thing to accept. And if you look historically, it did take people a long time to accept that actually this was right and the Galilean transformation was wrong. It didn't happen overnight. Okay. Um, and it required quite a lot of evidence to persuade people. So I, I want to talk about some of the evidence for the Lorentz transformation today. Okay. So that I'm going to make um, three points. So I've called that one, two, three, we call this A, B, and C. So the first thing I want to consider is what does the Lorentz transformation look like um, in everyday life? Okay? So in everyday life, we tend not to travel close to the speed of light. Right? We tend to travel quite slowly, and we don't measure enormous distances. We tend to measure you know, a, few, a few kilometers, but not millions of kilometers. The Lorentz transformation. everyday life. So if I focus first on the, the x-coordinate of the Lorentz transformation here, the only difference between the Lorentz transformation and the Galilean transformation, which is this one, is the appearance of this factor gamma. Okay? That's the only difference. Right, so let's look at what this gamma factor looks like. So as I said up there, this is 1 over the square root of 1 minus u squared over c squared. So I just want to give you some values to get you a sense of this function. So if we take the value u, which is 30 kilometers per second, so 3 times 10 to the 4 meters per second, that's the speed of the Earth around the Sun, and it's also about the fastest speed of any man-made object um, relative to the Earth. So if we use this factor of u and we calculate gamma, then gamma turns out to be equal to 1.0000. 0, 0, 0, 0, 5. Okay? In other words, it's basically equal to 1. Right? And if the gamma factor is equal to 1, then there's no difference. Right? There's no difference between this and that. At least the space part. Okay? So, 
that shows you a reason why, for us, the Galilean transformation is reasonable and why we never noticed this Lorentz transformation before. Because right? if you're at earthbound velocities, the gamma factor is incredibly close to 1. Okay? And if it's very close to 1, then you can't tell much difference between the Lorentz transformation and the Galilean transformation. Okay? So let me write that um, up here. Okay. So if gamma is approximately equal to 1, and this term here is also small, okay, which in, again, generally it will be because c squared is a very big number compared to x, so that means um, ux over t is much, much less than c squared. If these two conditions are true, then the Lorentz transformation is approximately the same as the Galilean transformation, right? up to a very, very good approximation. So this is some justification why we never noticed it before. Right? Because in everyday situations, things that we can do on Earth, they're basically the same, same transformation. If you plot a graph of what this gamma function looks like as a function of speed, this is gamma of u as a function of u, and obviously the maximum is c. Okay, well, it's not obvious the maximum is c. I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, um, so if u is zero, then it starts off at one. As u goes towards c, this goes to infinity. But it goes to infinity only at the very end. It goes something like this. In fact, it's even slower than that. So it's only at very, very high velocities that you start to see a significant difference. Okay? Um, so again, to give you a numerical value, if u is equal to 0.9 times c, so that means you're going at 90% the speed of light. Okay, no, let's not do that. Let's do 0.5 times c. So if, if you're going at half the speed of light, then you get a factor of gamma is equal to 1.16. Okay? So even going at half the speed of light, there's only a 16% difference between the two transformations. So the other one I, I was going to write down, if, if you're going at 90% the speed of light, then you find that gamma is 2.29. So at about 90% of the speed of light, you do start to see a significant difference. But you only see these differences when you're going really, really fast. Okay. Okay, so the thing that I said was obvious but is not obvious, let me talk about that now. The Velocity difference between these two observers is u, right? But you see in, in the Lorentz transformation here, there's a very big problem if u is bigger than c. In other words, if you're traveling faster than the speed of light, right? Because if you're traveling faster than the speed of light, then this gamma factor is, you know, well, it's the square root of a negative number, which is a problem, right, for, for reality. What this means is that the assumptions we made about combining length contraction, time dilation, and relative simultaneity to get a consistent theory only work if the speed is less than the speed of light. Okay? If you go faster than the speed of light, then you can't make a consistent theory out of these effects. Okay? So we'll see um, in a couple of weeks that actually in, special th in the special theory of relativity, C is the ultimate speed. It's not possible to go faster than C, no matter what you do. Okay? Um, so I'll just say that now. As I say, it's not obvious yet, but as we develop the theory, it will become obvious that you can't exceed the speed of light C. Okay? So the maximum relative speed between any two observers is C. Okay? 